I want to ask you, just first, ask, ask, ask. Backstage, you were just trying some uh, Canadian ketchup chips, so what was that like? Uh, don't eat a potato, a Canadian potato chip with ketchup right before you're going on an interview <laughs> where you have to speak and your lips have to work. <laughs> what's, uh, what's it been like so far here at, uh, at Fan Expo? Because uh, this is your first time in, in Toronto for Fan Expo. What's the experience been like for you? You've had people coming up to your booth, you're signing autographs all morning. Uh, first of all, the men have a lot of, there are a lot of beards up here. <laughs> have you noticed that? In America, in the, in the United States, they don't have beards. How do you feel, how do you feel when an, an American says, America? Do you feel like it's a stupid thing to say? <laughs> Seriously. No? Okay, in America, <laughs> there's not as many people with beards, not including the women. And, <laughs> and the, but there are some outrageously attractive Canadian women. Yes, there are. And then there are in the in between. <laughs> I'm in between. <laughs> I've had fun so far. What the hell? Fantastic. Uh, well, speaking of America, before we go into uh, your career as an actor, um, I do want to ask about this initiative, the, the Dreyfus Initiative .org. Uh, you have been campaigning and championing the idea of reintroducing the education of civics into the American education system for a number of years now. Why is that so important, and why is it so important to you? Are you aware of the uh, incident with the American Navy a couple of weeks ago? Which two one? two accidents in two days or something. Yeah. And a couple of people died. Yes. Um, one of the Navy spokesmen said, "It's because we forgot." To to teach the fundamentals, like navigating and steering. <laughs> and that's what civics is. You don't teach it, you don't got it. You don't got that, you don't got the fundamentals. And if you don't have the fundamentals of uh, a Republican democracy, which is the only government uh, system that actually gives real power to the majority of people who have never, ever had power. If you don't teach them the fundamentals, you're committing suicide and turning your country into a corrupt, decaying dog. And America, the United States, is one of the few countries on the face of the earth that has inherent meaning. Nobody in this world wakes up and says with hope and passion, I can't wait to get to Norway. <laughs> they say, I can't wait to get to America. Even Iranian extremists say, I can't wait to get to America. <laughs> they all want what we sell. Opportunity, mobility, freedom, boundaries, responsibilities. Everyone, we changed the course of history. We caused the greatest political revolution in the history of civilization, and now we don't teach it to our young, which is the most idiotic, stupid, selfish, self-serving, hypocritical, political move on the part of anyone I can think of, uh, other than maybe the Trojans taking in the horse. <laughs> and uh, it's not enough to teach how to be a member of parliament or how to be a member of Congress. It's not enough to teach what it's like to be a member of, you know, a mayor or a member of a municipal assembly. If you don't know the whys and wherefores, if you don't know that 
for the entire history of the human race, 98% of mankind lived in enforced ignorance, bondage, and punishment without a break of any kind that their existence on earth was simply a punishment where they chopped off your fingers, they flayed your back, or they killed you if you thought, I have a right to think or I have a right to worship until us. We had a war of independence from Great Britain, and then we stumbled onto the greatest, most complementary system ever devised, based on enlightenment values, the values of pet philosophers in aristocratic salons in France, and we took those ideas and threaded them through our government so that you can't have an American government that does not have boundaries on how, how much the government is allowed to oppress its own citizens. We don't teach it. Any of it. And there's an old saying, if they don't teach you that you have civic authority, you don't got it. And if you don't got it, you've sung the last song, folks. So I believe that the absence of the teaching of civic authority to the youngest of our young is an urgent political crisis. Donald Trump didn't uh, cause all of the decay. He's the result of 50 or 75 years of incredible stupidity and irresponsibility on the part of parents, school superintendents, politicians, and those who wish to put everything up to a scrutiny of cost. No one ever said, how much, does public school, how much do public schools cost? They never ever asked, because the answer was, whatever it takes. And now, they've decided, in the wisdom that they have, to cut your education. So they don't teach you shop, or home economics, or English literature, or the system of governance that you run, which makes it easy for thieves to steal the country, as they have done. And so, to me, the worst possible thing that could happen to the United States is the absence of the teaching of civic authority. And the most uh, blessed thing that could happen is the revival of the teaching of civic authority. And you don't have to go very far. Thank you. But you don't have to go. There's a part of the Constitution that is, they always say, uh, it has no, no meaning. It has no, it's not precedential, you know, in, in the legal system. But the preamble to the Constitution is a very simple set of statements. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and ensure the blessings of liberty on ourselves and our posterity, do ordain this Constitution. That's the mission statement of the United States. It's why we caused the largest 
voluntary mass movement of human beings in the history of civilization. It's why we were respected and admired. Its absence has caused us to turn into unthinking bullies. And we will not survive this century. Doctors call things like this invisible killers, like hypertension and uh, high blood pressure. They don't know why, but it'll kill you. Well, if you don't teach the meaning of America, it'll kill you. And I'll tell you one thing. When our parents went to Europe to fight Adolf Hitler, they knew exactly what they were fighting for. They were fighting a man who said, no negotiation, no compromise, no talk. I want your submission or death. And he came right up to the Atlantic until finally we woke up and went to Europe and killed him. The only difference between him and the caliphate is that one is speaking in Arabic and the other is speaking in German. But it's the same thing. No, sub no talk. No negotiation. I want your submission or death. And they mean it. They want to return the West to the fifth century. And the worship in Germany's case of Thor and Loki. Won't that be fun? And I'm going to try to make the most difficult hard pivot I've ever made in my career now. I've got to finish one thing. If you don't take this seriously, your neighbors will kill you. That's it. So, working with Steven Spielberg, huh? What's that like? I do want to thank you for that, that lesson on American civics to this Canadian audience. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, there's, there's some Americans who make the trek up here, but it was, it was wonderful to hear you talk about that, but we, we do want to try and add a little bit of levity to things. You can't really do that, though, can you? <laughs> I'm trying. Once, you've, once you've introduced this, it's kind of downhill from there on. <laughs> You know, that, that terrifying world trying. that is before us, that we're experiencing, we escape to these other worlds that are better, and through the stories that we, that we enjoy, and one of, the, one of the masters of Spielberg, who you've worked with, uh, obviously, a number of times, what makes him so, um, so powerful? What makes his stories last the, you know, the test of time? Well, he's an authority on civics. <laughs> He knows how to weave, um, because we need to be distracted. You know, that's why we, movies were so popular during the 30s, when we all wanted to kill ourselves. Oh, well, let's go to the movies instead. And, and that's not bad. It's a good thing. People laugh, people cry, people die. Countries die. And um, it's a great thing in a, in a society that is, that argues about art and commerce in, within itself. It's great. I, I made and lost fortunes doing this. And it's uh, important. And you also made a fortune betting on your own Oscar win. Is this true? Yes. <laughs> yes. I voted, I, I bet money that I would win. I bet money earlier that I wouldn't win. <laughs> And then later on, I bet a lot of money the next year after I won, I bet, quick, tell me how, who won the best actor last year? Uh, was it, uh, oh, the, the gentleman with the name who I can't pronounce. Yeah, Richard Dreyfuss. Was it. The answer was sitting right in front of me. And that's how, it's a great thing to win an Oscar. It's not 
the be all and end all. It's it's a nice thing. That's it. Uh, all right. Well, let's go to the floor for some questions. Go ahead. You're doing fine. Get in. Look. Look. You get get go on. You can okay. Take, all right. Take me. Why shouldn't I not ask you about uh, what about Bob? You should have asked me. Because I, I, that was one of my favorite movies when I was a kid. But I understand you and, and Bill Murray did not get along so well, and, and you're not such a fan of his anymore. But you can ask me. <laughs> if he's an asshole, but you can ask me. The appropriate for the children in the audience answer. Uh, he's an Irish drunken bully. Okay. That's it. And he's a better golfer than I am. <laughs> and he makes me laugh even though I find him a despicable pig. That's how talented he is, okay? I give it to you. I think he's a schmuck. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> Yeah. Um, when you're working on a on, on Jaws, are you imagining the impact that it would have on you know not just audiences but the whole film industry? It was the definitive blockbuster. Every film afterwards was like we got to be like Jaws in some capacity. Right. Or are you just working a regular job? I uh, predicted that it would tank. So that's how smart I am. I, I'm really smart about civics, but about the film industry, I'm an idiot. I did. I, I got on TV and I said, this film is going to tank. And I didn't know that just because I didn't know how films were made, that this film was not going to tank, and Stephen was a genius and all of that. Um, I said the same thing about American Graffiti. What's the big deal? It's just a little movie. So, I'm always, um, don't rely on me for that. <laughs> you can rely on me about civics. <laughs> and, uh, drugs and sex and history. But not about the film business. <laughs> Alright, well, let's go to the floor for some questions. Well, and I got more, but let's, let's involve the audience who, who have waited to ask some. Let's go to left first, and then we'll go over to our right. Microphone on? Nope. There you go. Now it's working? Yeah. Hi, Richard. It's uh, Mark from Montreal. Yeah. Got a question. How do you like working in Montreal all those years ago doing apprenticeship to the Kravitz? Um, how did I feel about working the in Montreal? Uh, uh, <laughs> I said, I said the apprenticeship of Tony Kravitz in Montreal. Did you like working on it? I would be sitting in a, in a bar and someone would walk up to me and say, excuse me, are you playing Diddy? And I would say, yes. He would say, don't move. And then he would turn to his friends and say, come here, I'm going to make you laugh. He's playing Diddy. And they would look at me and go, hmm. Because everyone knew what Diddy looked like. He was tall and skinny, had kinky hair, and he was not me. So one day I was standing on the set next to the director, Ted, and he says to me, see that girl down there? That's class. Go talk to her. So I did. I went down, introduced myself, and she says, may I ask you a question? I said, sure. She said, how does it feel that you are playing the deer and uh, uh, you don't look like the deer and uh, you don't make me think of the deer and uh, you're playing the deer. How does that make you feel? I said, pretty good until now. <laughs> and we lived together for three years. <laughs> uh, 
All right, let's go over to the right side. Great t-shirt. We're going up here first. Oh, up, up to the top. There you go. Hi, Richard. Uh, Steven Spielberg was asked in a documentary uh, what first came to mind uh, when he heard the word Jaws. And because he was young at the time and brave, he said, courage and stupidity. And he said, what? Courage and stupidity. And so, if I say the word Jaws to you, what jumps inside your head? Lots of money. <laughs> I mean, lots of money. And uh, waiting. It was, it, was, it was an experience of waiting. Because there was no shark. And there was no script. And there was no cast. <laughs> I was cast after the film started. And the original schedule of the film was May 2nd to June 28th. We left the island September 16th. And we were not finished. So most of the day was waiting for a sailboat to get out of the shot. It took an hour and a half and all we did was hope and pray and sacrifice animals to <laughs> the idea that another sailboat wouldn't go boop. And uh, every time the shark, there were so many radio mics on the island of Martha's Vineyard that you could actually follow the whole movie just by, you know, walking down a street and you'd hear, <clears throat> the shark is not working. <laughs> The shark is not working. <laughs> Repeat, the shark is not working. <laughs> and then one day you heard, the shark is working. The shark is working. The boat is sinking. The boat is sinking. And I was on that boat. And others. I, I mean, there are more stories, more great uh, stories about Jaws than any other movie ever made, I think. And um, my deal usually is, you ask me a question that I have not heard, I'll pay you 10 bucks. You ask me a question that I have heard, you owe me 10 bucks. <laughs> I'm way ahead. <laughs> well, there's a challenge. Let's go over to the right. We've got time for a few more questions. Hello. Uh, my question is, um, in the novel of Jaws, Hooper dies. Why was that changed for the film? Um, well, first they changed his name from Hoover to Ho Hooper. Did you say Hoover? No, I, I say it Hoover. Uh, I tell you why. Stephen said he wanted to make what he called a bullet. He was going to chuck every subplot, mafia, the affair, the real estate scam, everything. He wanted to make a movie about a shark. So when he asked to meet with me, he said, don't read the book. And to this day, I have never read the book. <laughs> and uh, he you know, told me that this is a great movie which I turned down, because I am an idiot. <laughs> and I turned it down twice. And then I saw The Apprenticeship of Duty Kravitz, which was the first time I'd ever watched me in the lead of a show, you know, an hour and a half, two hours long. And I just, I thought, if this is sold in the United States, I will never work again, because I'm terrible. And so then I called Stephen and begged him for the part. And I begged. And I got the part. <laughs> and uh, it took me 10 years to see Goody Kravitz clearly. You know, it just t took me forever. 
But I'm proud of it now. It took me a while. Let's go back to the floor. Over there on our left. Hello. Hello, Richard. Um, so, just, just over here. I mean, clearly everybody's here because you've made so many classic films in your career. Um, so, uh, I guess the question I have is, as an actor, um, how much influence did you have in, say, the final cut of the film? And um, did they, are there some films that actually exceeded your expectation or were better than you thought they were or um, were actually worse than you thought that they, they should be? Um, I, the, I think there's only one reason to want to be a star, and that's so that you have the right to be in the room and when the creative decisions are made. That your um, brain and mind is respected enough. And, um, and if I don't have that right, I have, I'm not interested in the process. Um, and I, I've made a number of films that turned out better. I made a film once with Rosie O'Donnell. We had the greatest time in the world. We thought it was the funniest film in the world. We cracked one another up all day long and had a wonderful time. We went to the press junket making jokes and cracking ourselves up and then we kind of realized that the press was not laughing. <laughs> and they thought the film sucked. And that was a shocker. Because we really did have such a great time making it. But you're not right all the time. And, uh, but there's so, this, it's so much fun to make people laugh. It's just so much fun. It's, it, what's, it's what gives nobility to acting and there's something that's it's a gift it's a blessed thing and I can feel an audience basically if I'm walking across the stage in a drama I can feel you on my on my face I know you're watching me and when I'm in a comedy I, I feel like I'm doing a great thing by, because what comedy does is it somehow goes inside of people and finds the, the most forgotten bit of pain and anguish and it just scoops it right up and throws it out of your life, even for a minute. And you can feel that happen. And I did a play some years ago in New York with 17 brilliant comic actors. I mean, everyone in that show was brilliant. And especially the second act of that show was like, we levitated Manhattan. And it was like, I always ask the, ask the producers to keep the lights up in the audience so that we could see their faces. And you could see them like cats in a bag. Their skeletal frame went one way and their souls went the other way and they were laughing themselves sick and it was like the greatest sensation in the world. And I'll tell you something. You know, you're walking down a street in Toronto or New York, wherever, and someone sees you, 80-year-old immigrant woman from Persia, and uh, she crosses the sidewalk and comes up and says, thank you. That is the greatest compliment, and they don't say that to their neurosurgeons, their divorce lawyers, or their rabbis. They say it to actors. Because actors give them relief from misery. 
Thank you. <laughs> Well, we are getting the rap from, from backstage, but if I could ask you one more before we go. Um, for, for someone who is aspiring to be an actor, uh, it's so rare that I have, I have the opportunity to speak to an Oscar winner with someone who has had such experience as yourself. Is there a, a magic lesson or note or thing to consider that will elevate your performances or, or make you a better actor? What small nugget of wisdom could you impart to this audience on that topic? When I was 16 years old, I was uh, in the actor's studio in Los Angeles, a couple of other theater groups, and I heard, we all heard, that there was this washed up yesterday's news forgotten guy from England named John Gielgud who was coming to Los Angeles to do a show called The Ages of Man and we went down to see him and I'm in the balcony and this little guy walks out and opens his mouth and I bifurcated into two separate people one of them was sitting with his friends in the balcony, and the other was experiencing awe for the first time, and gratitude that I had, I, I had been chosen by an art, or I chose to be an actor, and I was being shown what it could do by a prince of that art form, and I was like, I was, it was a revelation. I cannot tell you how important. And when it was over, I went backstage and I said, thank you. And I didn't say anything else. 20 years later, I had reason to, uh, I was doing a special about the Constitution and I needed someone to do a speech from the House of Lords in 1776, deriding the Constitution. So I wrote it out and I said, oh, what the hell? And I called Gielgud's agent and, and he agreed. And I flew to London. Now, I flew to London and showed up at the studio on Monday morning at nine o'clock and there was John Gielgud already in costume. Everything was lit, everything was ready. And so we rehearsed on film, brilliant. Did the first official take, brilliant. Second, brilliant. Changed the lens, changed the position, brilliant, brilliant. And we were done. It was 10 o'clock. And I, I, I thought, this is embarrassing. Because <laughs> it was a long speech, and he was like, we're perfect. And I went up to him, I sat down next to him, and I said, um, uh, it was, it's great, it's great. Um, uh, maybe, could you, maybe, uh, and I was desperately trying to think of something, and I thought of another way, right? And he goes, oh, how amusing, dear boy. <laughs> and he did it my way, perfectly. <laughs> and you can see his performance in this show that I did called Funny You Don't Look 200, which is Constitution for Kids. And, and I knew that at least up until that moment, I had lived a blessed life because I got to do the thing I loved. I was paid, I was praised, and I understood what greatness was, the submission of an actor to great poetry or prose. And it made me realize that I would never have to just be a schmigeggy, you know, with a two-line part, that I was, I, 
was thrilled and lucky that this art form had chosen me. And I mean it. I've never changed my mind. And I think it's more fun than you can possibly imagine. They pay you ridiculous amounts of money unless you're doing the theater. And um, it's great. You can't live without us. You know, acting is the only art form that's based entirely on pretense. You pretend the clothes you're wearing are yours, the words are yours, the movements are yours. You pretend you don't see the stage hand over there. And the audience pretends that it's not an audience. They're pretending that they're just watching real life. And it's, it's, it's this house of pretense that builds art and truth. And let me tell you, to know it, to know all of that sensation and do it, <laughs> there's no amount of money that can touch it. There's no, there's nothing that is as extraordinary and exciting as doing that right. Laurence Olivier was doing Othello in 1965. The last white actor ever to play Othello, which I think is a disgrace, totally wrong. But he was doing it, and the night, there was one night during the run where he was in the zone. And everyone knew it. And when actors had a chance, they would be on the phone calling their friends and saying, get down to the theater, he's in the zone. And he gave this extraordinary performance. And at the curtain call, he took his bow, he walked off stage, he slammed the door of his dressing room. And then they heard glass breaking and furniture flying and cursing and screaming. And they thought, he's lost his mind. And they started pounding on the door. Larry, Larry, what's the matter? Larry, you were fabulous. You were great. What's the matter? You were fabulous. And the door is flung open, and there is Olivier with tears streaming down his face through his black makeup. And he says, I know I was brilliant. I don't know how I did it. <laughs> Richard Travis, everyone, let's hope you